And let me move this because I'm likely to hang myself. Okay, you know it I is. I'm sorry? What I realize is when you've got the recorder and you're turning the recorder on, and I kick this thing on, it's watching you turn the recorder on. That's why you're looking down. Oh. I got to back over here again. Then okay, okay. Because he put one up for the start, and the picture that they had, it looks like I'm dead. <laughs> so nobody's going to want to turn on that, Roger. Because <laughs> I'm going to get down. <laughs> <laughs> I have to even forget they're there. No one, no one is here to see me. I know that, and thank God they're not here to hear me either. And we welcome you too. And we are ready to start. What we're going to do is a quick review and a quick, quick, because we want to get into new material. And I hope you guys are ready. This is good. This is good. Those of you who've been with me for a long time, you deserve what's coming. <clears throat> the rest of you, it's just. Wonderful to... to just in luck. It, <laughs> Don't believe in luck. I'm blessed. And it's a blessing, isn't it? Okay, yes. Okay, I'm waiting for them to get settled, and I guess they have. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> it is... Okay. Okay. It is Wednesday, February 20th. We are picking up in Revelation 19. Basically, we're picking up in verse 10. But to bring our minds back together, we're going to start with verse uh, 1 just as an overview. I'm not going to read every verse. I'm going to hit the highlights that when we started in this chapter, we had a wonderful class. I encourage you to listen to it if you didn't get to hear it another time because we started with a heavenly scene full of hallelujahs. And we just praised and we praised and we praised. We praised the Lord for his righteous acts. We praised the Lord that the judgment of Babylon had come. The harlot had been judged. And as we continued on, we saw many reasons to praise the Lord. I won't go into all of them, but we uh, focused on the 24 elders in verse 4 our last time to see them in scripture and we know they're representative of us so we'll get to see them in in reality one day soon and very soon that they are shouting out their praises to the lord and there's a voice coming out from the throne that voice in verse five is what i'm referring to we're going to hear that voice again in our lesson today so it's why i'm bringing it to your attention and uh, we see um, in verse six again another reason for the hallelujah the lord god omnipotent Almighty and reigning right there. Lord, God, omnipotent, almighty, reigning. I've got five reasons right there. The grace yes. of God to be praising and shouting hallelujah and looking Woo-hoo. forward to when we'll be in the midst of that bodily, not just spiritly. spiritly. <laughs> okay, and then verse 7, we started into the marriage feast. We saw that the bride is revealed that Satan had his counterfeit, the harlot, mystery Babylon done away with and judged. Now we have the marriage of the lamb. And remember here on earth, we get it backward. It's the bride that's important here. In the the heavenly marriage, it is the bridegroom who is important. It is the lamb who is important. We went into the different um, stages of the marriage at that time. It's called the oriental marriage, but it doesn't mean... China and places like that is just the phrase that's given to the Middle Eastern area at that time. We'll hit on that just slightly today, so I won't bring it out in detail here, but reminding you that Jehovah, God the Father, is looked at in scriptures having a wife whose name is Israel, who has been like a harlot to him, unfaithful, uh, widowed, but not forgotten. And we see that that, that relationship is restored. And then, uh, pardon me, I've got the hair in my eye. Uh, And we saw the difference between that and the bride of the Messiah, the bride of Yeshua, the bride of Jesus, being what we commonly call today the church. The called out assembly, those who are faithful to have put their faith in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. It started at the time of Pentecost, as you're probably familiar calling it, Shavuot, in Acts chapter 2. We'll continue on until we are raptured, taken home by the Spirit who seals us now unto that day of redemption. We saw in typology a picture of a Gentile bride because the church is is considered a Gentile even though there are Jewish people in that church body. And when you come into that church body, Ephesians chapter 2 especially describes it very well. One new man. We're not Jewish or Gentile, male or female, free or slave. 
I forget that there was one more description. We're one in Yeshua Jesus, and we all come to saving faith the same way also. That, that was the mystery that was revealed with the, the church. And we saw that she has made herself ready. Actually, she didn't do it herself. The Lord made her ready. She has put on the bridal gown. That's the robe of righteousness. She has been crowned. The crowns are what we have done for the Lord. But what's most important is that righteous robe. And we see that in her readiness, the marriage has taken place. That's taken place, I'll say, if you want to put it this way, in heaven. We know actually we're married to him now, but consummated, completed in heaven. We're going to see that marriage feast. Some say it takes place in heaven, but I'm a little more of the opinion, and I'll be bringing that out as we come into it, that it actually takes place on earth right at the very, very beginning of the millennium. And I'll show you why I'm putting it there as we go on. But that's what we're going to be picking up, because in verse 9, we were looking at who's invited. You don't invite the bride to her own wedding, so it's not the bride. And we looked at it last time, and we said that we see Old Testament and Tribulation saints that have been invited to this. They are called the guests, and they have to have a wedding garment also, because they've also come in through Yeshua Jesus. The difference being they didn't come in during the time uh, that the bride was formed called the church. Remember, the church is presented as a bride to Yeshua Jesus, the bridegroom. So they're, they're saved also. Everyone's only saved the same way through Yeshua Jesus, whether they were before him in his incarnation, looking forward to the cross, whether they lived with him at the time, or whether looking back as we do today. Salvation is the same. So please hear me loud and clear. One way of salvation throughout time, one name under heaven whereby man may be saved, that name being in English, Jesus, in Hebrew, Yeshua, he's one and the same. Okay, so he's our bridegroom. We're his bride. Um, the Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints, and remember, saint simply means set apart, sanctified unto God. What it means is that they've come to saving faith in Yeshua Jesus. That's why you have saints before and after what's called the church age. That's why when you read the word saints in the book of Revelation, you don't go into a panic that, oh, we're going to be there. No, those who can the faith, saving faith will be the ones who are called saints after the raptures occurred during the period called tribulation. The same way before the church age even began, you have those who believed in Yeshua Jesus called saints. So Abraham is a saint. David is a saint. All the way through in Yeshua's time, Yochanan, our writer, John, is a saint. And then when we come to the other side, well, Yochanan John is even an example of us also because he's part of what is also this age. Okay? So with all of that in mind, remember the biblical um, Wedding. Let me also say this first, and then I'll remind you the biblical wedding. Um, we're coming to a marriage feast, and we've talked about how glorious it is because we're with the Lord. Let's look real quick, okay? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 1.10. I think it's important to start right there, and this will lead us into our new material for today also. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. We read, and this is written by Shaul Paul. This is written to a, a congregation. Today we call them a church in Thessalonica. That's why it's called the Thessalonians. We're Californians. Same idea, okay? So he's writing to these people who are believers in Yeshua Jesus. And he writes, And to wait for his son, Yeshua Jesus, whom he raised from the dead. God raised Yeshua Jesus from the dead. To appear from heaven and rescue us from the impending fury of God's judgment or of God's wrath. Now, notice how he's not talking about that they need to get saved. He's made very clear they are saved. They're believers in Yeshua Jesus. They have been saved. So if they're already saved and they're looking toward a coming wrath, what are they looking toward? They're looking toward the tribulation, the wrath of God being poured out. Okay, And he's bringing out very clearly that Yeshua Jesus is going to return. He's going to rescue from the coming judgment of tribulation. Okay, Another encouragement for us that we go before. All right? Um, may I ask you a question? Yes, you sure may. Okay. I'm confused because you said uh, 
the people that the guests that are uh, going to be invited are from the tribulation. Does that mean after it's all done? Yes. Yes. So We've moved through. Uh, well, we. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep our group separate, and that's a good question. Okay. We have. Um, and I'm trying to think the simple way to put. Let me let me just boil it down this way easily. Okay, here's a line of saved people today. Okay, saved, saved today. Here comes the Lord in rapture. Okay, he comes down in the air. We meet him up in the air. And yes, Arlu, I should have brought my chart in. Sitting in the trunk of my car, which did not make it here today. That's why I'm going to go real simple. Okay? We're raptured. Now, my belief, my way of understanding is now is a time on this earth called the tribulation. Okay? Now, I spent other classes where I proved my point of the timing. But regardless even of where exactly you put the timing, I think you'll still follow and agree with this. But if you want why I say it this way, I can get you some other CDs where I spent an hour and a half and longer on proving this point via scripture. Okay? In the tribulation, I'm going to also color it green here because they are people who get saved in the tribulation. So they are saved saints here, just like there are saved saints now, okay? Now, we are part of this group. We've been raptured. We've put on a robe of righteousness, and we saw that in Revelation 19 that we're going to come back with the Lord. We're going to go into that more today. We come back in our robe of righteousness. We come back with our crowns. That means that we've been to the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat of Christ. Okay, so I'm going to put that up here. It's a heavenly scene. The Bema seat, it's the judgment seat, okay, of, and I'll put Christ because that's the name you're probably most used to hearing. Remember, Christ is anointed one, Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew, Christ from Christos in the Greek, all means the anointed one. So up here, we've received that robe of righteousness, we've received our crowns. That's taking place, I believe, honestly, while the tribulation's going on down below, Okay. These people that are saved during the tribulation, if they're martyred, we find them under the throne. So there's a throne up here. I'm running out of room. <laughs> okay, there's a throne here. And under the throne, and so I'll put it under, I'm going to put martyred. Okay? Martyred saints. Now, the tribulation has come to an end. Messiah comes all the way down, and notice there's not another arrow going up. He's come down, and I'll put here, Mount of Olives is his final destination. He sets up in, and that's, by the way, Jerusalem. And because I am not afraid to take a political stand, Israel. <laughs> <laughs> And I love to emphasize that. <laughs> okay, so he comes down, he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. We read that the Mount of Olives cleaves in two, north to south, opens up an east to west valley. It's huge. In that area, he's going to do the temple that we read about in Ezekiel 40 through 48. This temple is filled with the glory of the Lord. The temple, and I'll put temple of the Lord here. Okay, the temple that we read about during the tribulation time is not the temple that is filled by the glory of the Lord and built by the Lord, okay? That's going to be man's doing. The sacrifices start. The Antichrist stops them in the middle. We've, we've studied all of that, okay? So here's the return of the Lord to the earth. This is where we've come to in Revelation 19, where we're talking about when we look at the beginning. Um... Okay, after these things ties it to chapter 18. Chapter 18 gave us the destruction of Babylon, literally, the commercial, political destruction. Remember, 17 gave us the spiritual destruction. 18 gave us the political and commercial. 
we've been going through the seals. The seals led into the trumpets. The trumpets led into the bowls. We're in that seventh bowl being poured out, which is at the end. We see the whole culmination at the Battle of Armageddon. That's what's happening right here when the Lord returns. I think I could do black for battle. <laughs> okay, the Battle of Armageddon. And we're going to talk about that in this chapter still in more detail also. He stops the Battle of Armageddon, and that's where he sets up his temple. This is where we have the marriage feast. I'll put it in. Okay, the marriage has taken place. Really, the marriage has taken place before the rapture, but we see it. We receive the benefits of it in heaven, okay? We know we're saved now that we're with our bridegroom when we're in heaven, okay? Right now, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. He keeps us till we're home, okay? No worries. You can go through the prince of the pality or the powers of the air on your way to heaven. You go through so fast. You go through, I mean, if we had time, I'd let the nee, 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 nee. <laughs> There's no time. <laughs> but my, my point is the Holy Spirit has sealed us and taken us safely through, through the domain of Satan into heaven, okay? And he's heard a lot worse than that from me in this last week, too. <laughs> okay? Now, at this point here is where we're talking about having the marriage feast, okay? Have you gone to a marriage have you seen the ceremony? Do you eat together? But for the ones that have that, do you eat together before the marriage? No. 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 You have the ceremony, then you have the feast. Okay? Ceremony, in essence, finalized up here. Here's our oh, marriage supper. Okay? Here's our feast. Okay? The marriage supper. Here's our feast. Okay? And I'll show you why I think it's here as we go through this. If you're of the opinion and you put the marriage feast up here before you come down, that's okay. It's not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm splitting it something that I'll show you when we get to it that makes me think it takes place on earth. Okay? Okay, yeah, I think so. I'll show you why when we, when we get there. I want to do it in order. I think, I think it'll keep you from being confused. No, I'm debating, but I think it's still the best. Okay? Um, let me show you two other things real quick. Number one, because you're in Revelation 19, just look down at verse 17 real quick. Okay, we will get there. But we see there it says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly into heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God. And verse 18 tells us, So you eat the flesh of kings and of commanders, of mighty men, of horses, those who sat on them, uh, the flesh of all men, free men, and slaves, small and great. Okay? That's not a marriage feast. No. <laughs> okay. That's a great feast for the birds. That's a great feast for the birds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's for the birds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are talking about a different. Our feast is a feast with our Lord. Okay. It's totally different. And this is what they've been invited to. Now, I'm not going to go into it in depth right now. But if you go to Matthew 25, you go to verses 1 through 13, you have the guests that are invited to the marriage feast. That's where you have your ten virgins, five were ready and five weren't. The ones that were ready when the, the bridegroom came, they went into the feast. They went into the marriage and the feast together. The door was locked. The idea behind it is you can't decide later. You either are ready when the Lord has returned, or you are out, okay? Matthew 25, what? 1 through 13. Okay, it's a parable there. But what you'll notice in it, too, when you read about it, is there are some that, that try to get in, and they don't have the wedding attire on. What don't they have? They don't have the robe of righteousness. Yeah. They don't belong to the family, so they're cast out, Okay. The closest we can get to that, because we can't follow every detail specifically, but the closest we can get to it is when I hear that the Lord says there will be people that will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and that in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, notice for all who have tried to use that to come to teach against eternal security, notice he didn't say, I knew you. But you blew it, so I don't know you. He didn't say that, did he? He said, no, I never knew you. You were never a part of me. The other places where Paul does say it, that they were all with us, but they weren't all a part of us. So please hear that loud and clear. 
The Lord never knew them. They never had partaken in his salvation. He, they had never become his child. The same way that in our natural, when we see the birth of a child, I don't care what that child does. I don't care how horrendous the act is. They're still the child of those parents. Even if the parents want to say, I never knew you. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> they did know that child. Okay, And sadly, there are some on both sides who want to deny parents and want to deny children. Is that word new, the same word used in Genesis when it says, um, Adam knew you? When he knew her, he knew her. In a physical relationship, uh, the, the, and then in, in a spiritual sense, yes, an intimacy, yes. It's not just a knowledge; it's a it's an actual intimate, yes, in that sense. But you definitely have to turn it to the spiritual. Right. Yes. When you say he, I never knew you. Does that mean just people that do nice things, uh, but they never accepted Jesus as their savior? It could be those they were just definitely. Good people, yes. But they never were religious or accepted him as their savior. Yeah, religious would not be your key word because it, religion isn't what it's about. Relationship, but yes, yes, and that's also where you have cults that say that they're part of the Lord. But they're not, and we know they're not. Because if you test the spirits to see if they're true and they don't line up with Scripture, you know that they're not. When they preach another, preach another Jesus, teach another doctrine, Paul says anathema. You know, those are the ones. But they, they think they're fine. They think they're, you know, they're right with God, and they want to show you how to be right with God. That's why it's so important to know what the Word of God says, not what the Word of man says, but what the Word of God says. And why I tell you all the time, Get into the scriptures. Don't just take it because I said it here in class. Don't just take it because your pastor says it on Sunday. Take it because you've opened up the word of God and you, by divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh who is within you, you see it in the word of God. And especially when it comes to what's doctrinally sound, it's all about Yeshua Jesus. That's it. When we get into it today, we talk about how the testimony of prophecy is Yeshua, is Jesus. Everything's Jesus. That's what it's all about. So it's got to be in relation to him. What did you do with Yeshua, Jesus? If God were to ask a question in heaven by those who are standing before him for judgment, that would be the one question he would ask. It would not be, what did you do with your life? How good of a person were you? How many good acts did you do? How many people did you talk to about Jesus? Because people talk about him. That doesn't mean that it's right. But if he asks, what did you personally do in relation to my son who is equal to me, Yeshua Jesus? There is the whole crux. When that person stands there and says, what did I do? I accepted him into my heart as my savior. I asked him for forgiveness of my sin that I could stand here before you today in your eyes pure. God would say, come right on in. But if you say anything else, even if you say, oh, I, I told people he was a good teacher. No. My Jewish no. people, unfortunately, that are not believers, yeah. say he was a good rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> now, if he was a good rabbi and he claimed to be God, <laughs> how does that make him good if he wasn't speaking truth? <laughs> it falls apart, doesn't it? But And there are others further out than, than that who say that they're in the name of Jesus, but we know by testing the waters, they're not. That's why I say be very careful. Satan, what's he do best? Counterfeit. How do you get messing down a child? You add sugar. Yeah, a little bit of truth, a little bit of sweet, a little bit of good to make the medicine go down. And that's what Satan does, counterfeits that truth. Gives you just enough that, oh, this sounds good. But then he twists it and he turns it because he wants the worship. He wants the service. He wants the person. And they end up in hell, sadly, sadly. But God's given everyone the ability, the spark of faith within each soul to believe. The Ruach HaKodesh to tug them, to draw them, to bring them to saving knowledge. No one can stand before God and say, I didn't have a chance. No one can. Because even in the creation around us, it speaks of a creator designer 
who wants an intimate relationship with every single person that he has given life to. Bless you. Because life comes from God. Amen. And I can give you story after story after story where that my point for class today of how God has reached out to the jungles, who has reached out into a home that is as godless as can be and saved a child out of it. There are so many ways. We know that God says in the scripture he's not willing that any would perish. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't stop at anything short. What could be short of giving your own son to die on the cross, to leave heaven, to come down to earth for that sole purpose? There's nothing greater that could be done. So he has done it all, and it's for all. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We have uh, boxes now with their language taken to the, pur- to the furthest uh, villages now with their language learning about Jesus. Yes. So the witch doctors are getting saved. There's all kinds of testimonies going out there. There's all kinds of testimonies. And we know in our book of Revelation, before the end comes, before this final battle, before the marriage supper of the Lamb, we know that God sends out 144,000 evangelists, Jewish evangelists, Jewish Billy Graham's, however you want to put it. He sends them out to the ends of the earth. Then he also has an angel that's flying through heaven that's preaching the gospel. And he's raised up two witnesses that are going to be seen worldwide through through the the uh, of today, the, the media. Media, media of today, yes, yes, yes. All kinds of ways. The word goes out. The manifestation's taking place. And can you imagine anyone saying, wow, I want to know that God that thundered, that God that, that brought this plague, that God that can do this. I want to know him. Can you imagine God saying, I don't want to know you? <laughs> no, no, that's not our God. No. That's not our God. Okay, so back on track. We're back to the marriage supper. We've had the marriage. Now we're going to have that feast, and it's not Revelation 19, 17. That, again, we said is for the birds. It's not for the people. Okay, Um, but now uh, I was showing you how we're spared from the wrath of God's judgment. We're spared from this tribulation period. It wasn't talking about our salvation. We already had our salvation, and then he said that we're looking for him to rescue us, to come from heaven before that judgment um, happens. And go to 1 Thessalonians 3 if you're still in uh, chapter 1. Go to 3 and verse 13, and we read there, so that he may give you the inner strength to be blameless by reason of your holiness when you stand before God our Father at the coming of our Lord Yeshua with all his angels. Okay, we've been raptured. We're in heaven. We've received our rewards. When he comes back down here... This is the time that it says that he comes with his angels. He also comes with us. Let's keep going in our chapter and we will see that. Okay, so we see the difference. What I'm pointing out to you is there is a coming for his saints and there is a coming with his saints. Remember my little mouse and every word, how important it is, all the the prepositions. If it's under, it's under. If it's over, it's over. If he's coming for, he's coming to. If he's coming with, we're with. There's a big difference to come for somebody and to come with somebody. Okay, so we see that very clearly different. Here he comes for, here he comes with. Here it stops in the air, here it comes down to the ground. That's just two, just two of many ways that that it's different. So we do not put that together. We see this called the second coming because the first coming, where did he come? The first coming, very good. He was born in Bethlehem. Where am I going to put it? I'm going to put it all the way back here. I'm going to put... No, no, no. Let's not do an asterisk. Let's do a star. (laughs) Because they saw his star, didn't they? There's our star. Okay, and I'll put it in the English. Jesus, Yeshua... His birth. And where did his birth take place? Bethlehem. Very good. Bethlehem is where? <laughs> Bethlehem. <laughs> I'll just put it easily. You're right on what you're saying Israel. also. That Israel's what Israel. it was after. Because we put here, he's coming to Jerusalem, Israel. 
So that's why I'm just putting it simply. But you're right. He came to Bethlehem, after to Bethlehem of Judea. That's all in Bethlehem, Israel. And that's very important today, too, because our news media wants to put Bethlehem, comma, something else. So God said it. I believe it. <laughs> okay? So he did, that's why this is called the first coming. I don't want to get off track of what I was saying. That's why this is called the first coming, because he came all the way down to earth. He put his footprints on earth. If you want to be totally gullible, you can go to Israel and they'll show you the footprint where he ascended into heaven on the rock. Now, I know he ascended into heaven from Israel, but I don't believe in the footprint, okay? But first coming, down to earth. Second coming would be down to earth then. The rapture in the air is different. That's why it's not called the second coming, because that's totally different. Okay? Yes, Eric? Uh, when uh, they refer to the every eye will see him, yes. are talking about? Yes, right here. Okay. Matthew 24, okay. 30. Okay. And I'll put it here, Matthew 24, 30. Yeah, all right. Is every eye. But they're not going to, when we get raptured, they won't all see him come and get us? When we're raptured, ah, uh, that says I. Okay, when we're raptured, the believers are caught up. They're going to wonder what happened. They're going to wonder where did they go. Now, New Age already has answers out there. They're already sending out a teaching that it is we Christians who are holding back the peace of the world. And when we've been removed, don't worry about them. They're not being harmed. They've been taken to where they can have their minds open. And when they know and they understand and are in harmony, hmm, then we'll bring them back and we'll have hmm, harmony. We'll have the age of Aquarius. It's very hard for me not to have it. Not to be <laughs> that way. So there are answers like that already going out there. Because what is Satan doing? He's setting up for what he knows is coming. He doesn't know when it's coming either. But he knows it is coming because no one can thwart what God says. Yeah. So yes, no. When it talks and when you follow it in order. And again, we've done this before and we'll still be going at it. But not verse by verse right now. But when you look at Matthew 24... Verse 3 says, As Yeshua, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples, the Talmudim, came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And when you keep that in Jewish context, you know these are Jewish boys who have been told all along about the kingdom of God on earth, what we call the millennial kingdom. That's what they're looking forward to. They're looking for the Messiah to come, rule and reign, set Israel up as head nation, fulfill the promises of the prophecies that the Messiah is to do. When's that going to happen? Because what you've just told us, Lord, in the first couple of verses of chapter 24, you've told us that, that the temple is going to be destroyed. You've told us... Um, Yeshua, Jesus, verse 1, departed from the temple of his Talmudian kingdom, showing him the buildings of the temple. And Yeshua said to them, See you not all these things? Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Yeshua just told him, Your beautiful temple that you're showing me, saying, Look how glorious it is, is going to be destroyed. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeshua goes up on the mount, and the Talmudian might seem talking among each other. Do you get it? I don't get it. He just told us our temple is going to be destroyed. Isn't our temple going to be the focal point for the, the nation of Israel, for all the nations of the world to come up and to be worship, to worship, I'm mean, sorry, to worship the Lord? And he just said it's going to be destroyed. I'm confused, Lord. See, we've got the benefit of the whole scripture written for us where we can read it and study it and go over it and over it and over it we have the beauty of looking back and seeing they're looking forward and they're not understanding everything and Yeshua has been with them at this point probably three years that he's been talking with them but have you ever tried to learn a new language? <laughs> it's difficult. And he's been talking to them in parables. He's been talking to them about heavenly things. He's been talking to them about things that they need enlightenment and understanding about. And I'll give you one more problem for them. Because Yeshua has not yet died and ascended back into heaven. 
Exactly. They're not being indwelt by the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who is confirming everything to us, who is revealing everything to us, who is reminding us, who is teaching us. That's the difference for us. So we have to understand where they were coming from. And they are following him. They've come to love him. When Yeshua says to them, are you going to leave me too? And I can hear the agony in him when he's saying that because he's seen so many turning away from him. And Peter, Kepha says, where else would we go? You have the words of life. So they're following him, and they're, they're catching it, but they're not understanding everything. And because they, for so long, as a Jewish-minded Talmud disciple, they're looking for that kingdom of heaven on earth. They're looking for God's will in heaven and on earth. They're looking for Yeshua to sit on the throne. They're looking for Rome's bondage to be broken. They're looking to be free. They're not free right now. If they tick off Herod, they're in big trouble. You see Pontius Pilate. He's so scared he doesn't know which way to move because if he ticks off his authorities, he's in trouble. He doesn't want his head to roll. And yet he's one of the lower men on the totem pole, so who's he going to blame it on? Where's he going to turn? There's not freedom going on. And Yeshua just threw him again for another loop. You're not talking about setting up your kingdom, Lord. You're talking about destruction. You're telling us you're going away? Wait a minute. When is this coming age? When is the end of the age? When is the, the, what we call the millennial kingdom? When is the kingdom on earth? When are you going to sit on David's throne? You promised all the way back. Our prophet Shmuel, Samuel, told us, if you want proof, chapter 7, verse 16 on, that there's going to be someone sitting on the throne of David forever. Now you're telling us we're not even going to have this. So Yeshua goes through this whole description for them. And he takes them in order. It's a very orderly chapter of 24. He takes them through what we call Daniel's 70th week. You go to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, you have it all there also. I spent class and class and class on that, so I can't take that time today. But read them on your own. If you have questions, come to me. If you want the other CDs, I'll get them for you. Because the Lord makes it very, very clear. I love that he gave us a road map. Amen. He didn't send us out into the dark. He gave us a road map. And even though we will not, because we're raptured, we still need to know what's coming. We still need to tell the world what's coming. And for whenever that rapture happens, how are people first going to get saved? I think the ones that are first going to get saved are the ones that we've been witnessing to. And all of a sudden, they're gone. Wow, they even told us about that too. Maybe I ought to look in what they believed in, and maybe I ought to read it for myself, and the truth will come to them, because the Holy Spirit doesn't leave this earth devoid. It's just like he did before the, the, um, the church. We're going to put... Ah, okay, I'm just going to put it here, okay? It's, it's bigger than that, but it's here, Okay. Before Acts 2, and I'll, I'll put that, Acts 2, okay? Acts 2 is when the Holy Spirit comes on them. It's, they see it like a tongue of fire. They are able to speak in languages they have not learned. But notice they were no languages. You know who was there? Jewish people, because they'd come up to Jerusalem for the feast. They were there because they were supposed to be. They're going to hear it, and they might live in Italy and speak Latin, and they might live in, I don't know if, it, I, I can't say it's gotten as far as Spain. Give me something else. Greece, okay? And they speak Greek. There's other languages that are being spoken. All of a sudden, they're hearing out of the Talmudim, they're hearing their own language. And they're hearing the gospel being preached, and it pricks their hearts, and they get saved, and they run back home after the feast is over. Guess what happened at Yerushalayim? Guess what I've learned? And they spread the gospel. And then God raises up Shaul Paul, who really helps get the gospel Amen. through the Roman roads, because Rome has built the roads. And he gives it to us much in Greek, because Greek is like English today. So it was the common language. It also has been given to us. We have gospels, especially in Hebrew, because it was reaching the Jewish people. But we had Jewish... Greek-speaking Jews also called Hellenists. 
They were from Alexandria and other places where there's a huge Jewish population. In fact, Alexandria was where the biggest was, especially when Jerusalem was destroyed. That's where it was preserved and where it was carried on, one of the places. So anyway, the gospel went out then. God uses different ways and means at different times, but the common denominator was the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is what was represented by a rushing wind that went through that house. The wind, you cannot see it, but you see its results. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but we see the results. How did Avraham cross over from idolatry to worship the one true and living God? It was by the Spirit of God that called him, and he stepped forward. He crossed over. That's why he's called Hebrew, because Hebrew means crossed over. He crossed over from idolatry into true worship of the one true and living God. He also literally crossed over the river and came into a new area, came down to the promised land. But what, what it's referring to, more importantly, is his relationship with God. That was by the Spirit of God. Why do you have David, David in his Psalms? And his Psalms are so encouraging to us. He's up, he's down. He praises the Lord through it all. He praises him when he's up, he praises him when he's down. But he says, oh Lord God, don't take your spirit from me. He knew the difference. He knew when the Spirit of God was on him, helping him do a work, a ministry. He knew when that wasn't there. And he lacked it and he missed it. The closest we can get to understanding is if you are out of fellowship, you know you're in a wrong place. And you feel that tug to bring you back. But the Spirit's still in you because God promised a new thing with this church. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 tells us that he was going to put the Holy Spirit within us now. Uh, the Lord told his Talmudim, when I go back up to heaven, it's even better for you because someone's going to come who is going to indwell each one of you, who's going to bring back to your remembrance, who's going to help you understand. Why was that better? Because there was only one bodily Yeshua Jesus. So he could only be in one place at a time. Now, he's still God, and he still can move, and we see that. Came through the, the building, the closed doors in the upper room, and poof, he was in their midst. So I'm not limiting him, but he limited himself in that body. And now, it's like right here. How many of us have the Holy Spirit within? And wherever we go, yes. <laughs> and wherever we go, the Holy Spirit's with us. So as I'm teaching, you're either feeling, hey, she is right on target. I know this is right. I see it here in the scripture. I agree with this. Or you're saying, hmm, I'm not sure about this. Let me search a little further. And the Holy Spirit will guide you also into all truth. So he's promised that. And he's promised that he will be with us until we're home. That's what Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says. It says that he's our down payment. It's like the engagement ring. Remember the betrothal I brought out? Remember when that bridegroom made that, that covenant with the bride? She stays at her home while he makes the new home, while he builds it. But if she needs anything, who's taking care of her needs? He is. He is. He's taking care of her needs already. How? Via the, the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh. So even though he's in heaven, his spirit's within each one of us. And he's helping each one of us. And he says, you'll stay in that spirit sealed till you're in heaven. Till you get to claim it. Till you get to stand at the gates. Because that's what everybody says. <laughs> <laughs> Open them wide. I'm coming in because the spirit's bringing me in. That's not exactly how it happens because we don't ask. It's not closed. And we just go flying in so fast. I can't even blink fast enough to tell you how fast. But the point is the Holy Spirit's with us and takes us. And he's in us until then. That's what is unique to this period of time. The indwelling permanently of the Holy Spirit. Before it wasn't and after it won't be. But notice we have people saved before and we have people saved after because no one can get saved without the Ruch HaKodesh tugging at their heart, bringing them to the knowledge of God and then them opening their heart to accept. Okay, so having said that and, and all of that, I hope I have not dropped any thought. I'm back to where we were. <laughs> we're back to that feast. And we've, had, uh, we've, we've seen that we've got our garment on when you read Matthew 25 and you read about the ones that are there that, that did not belong. They're the ones that try to get in but don't belong because they didn't have the wedding garment. They didn't have the right garment. 
They came in, oh, I did good deeds. They came in, I was of this religion. Well, I was born in America. Didn't that make me a Christian? It's a Christian nation. Well, if you were born in a garage, are you a car? Okay, so the wedding supper. Notice now, let me go back to that oriental marriage. Okay, the, the legal consummation was when the parents had agreed that their bride was going to be married to this man, to this groom. And uh, we see that. Let me take you real fast. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Ephesians, where'd you go? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And we read, Praise be out and I. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who in the Messiah has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. In the Messiah, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. In the Messiah, he chose us in love before the creation of the universe to be holy and without defect in his presence. Before God ever created this world that you and I are in today, he chose us and he said, what did we just read? We're holy, we're without defect in his presence and in his love. He has chosen us to enjoy every spiritual blessing in heaven. When an inheritance is ours. Hallelujah. This is the, this is the best a bride could ever hope for. <laughs> and it's ours, okay? God chose us before the foundation of the earth. That is amazing. Now, the bridegroom comes to claim his bride at that rapture. Father said, son, you've built enough. The home is ready. Go get your bride and bring her home. And I don't know who's more excited, the bride yeah. or the groom. <laughs> We're caught up to be with the Lord. And then after that ceremony, we can say, and we've got the Bema seat proving that we've been there, that we've been clothed in his righteousness, so that we're allowed to be there. We've been given our crowns, which are rewards for what we've done for the Lord. Notice how at that time when we, we read 1 Corinthians 3 and other places, when we read about reward and loss of reward, and when it says you stand before God to be judged for, for what you've done and not done in the body, notice they're standing in heaven. They're not standing on the outside saying, have I done enough I can get in? Oh, thank God. Who would ever know when they had done enough to deserve? <laughs> we couldn't. But they're in heaven. And Shaul Paul makes it very clear. He says that they are saved. Even if all their work burns up, everything they think they've done for the Lord, they did in the flesh, they didn't do anything for the Lord, they never tuned in and served him, he still says they're saved so as by fire. And as my mom used to say, you might smell a smell of smoke on their tail. <laughs> they might have a mini gown instead of a flowing robe, <laughs> but they're still covered. They're still in. It's not a matter of salvation. It is a matter of reward or loss of reward. Crowns. We're told there's all kinds of crowns for the, for life. There's there's the crown that if you lose your life, you're the martyr's crown. There's five different crowns in Scripture for different reasons. There's the crown for leading someone else to the Lord. And what we do with those crowns, we're going to see. If you don't know, just hang out. They just more hang than on. one crown. Do we give all our crowns back to Jesus? You do later whatever you feet. want with those crowns, well, but I know what I'm doing. Crown at his feet. Yes, it does. So we'll, you we'll run we ahead. lay all our crowns at his feet if we burn more than one crown. Well, let me ask you, Pam. Would you want to? Yeah. <laughs> then I think you will. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you can't wear again, one on top of another. You can't. And even high. if you could, again, I, I bring you to the example, earthly example, but I bring you to the example. Someone has done something really great for you. Let's even take it to an extreme, okay? I hear it on the news every so often where someone saves somebody else's life. And especially when it's involved like a child, what does that parent do? They've tried to find every way to shower their, their, the one who saved their child. Give them gifts. You know, get them on the news. Recognize this one. He's a hero. They do everything they can to show this person appreciation. Well, when I'm standing in heaven and I realize fully, I don't get it fully here. And it's so overwhelming here that it takes my breath away here. But when I am in his presence, 
when I see the wonders of heaven oh and I realize my Savior left all this. Mm. He left the freedom of not being in a body to confine himself to a body, to confine himself to time. I hate time. I don't know about you. I'm watching that stupid time right now. <laughs> he confined himself to time. He confined himself to a body. He confined himself to a space. He left the glories. I can't imagine being in the presence of God, holy, pure, love, joy, no sorrow, no sickness, no disease, no cancer, no death. No nothing no pain he left that he knew when he left it I'm going to come down to earth humble and lowly I'm not going to go be born in the palace and be treated with royalty I deserve that and more but I'm going to give all of that up I'm going to be laid in the feeding trough of an animal for my first crib the feeding trough, trough of an animal in a cold stable. Yes. Stinky. Yeah. That's yeah. Stinky. stinky. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I am going to be misunderstood. I'm going to be mistreated. I'm going to move toward the one reason why I came. And that reason is to die. How many of you were born with a hope to die? No. Came out of the womb and said, let me die, let me die. You don't say, well, if you tell me that I'm going to die, I'm going to come out. <laughs> right. Let me stay in here where it's safe and warm. He knew. He knew he would suffer a horrible death physically, but he knew even more than that. And this is what takes my breath away. He's still holy God that's come down to earth. He's still pure and righteous. He's still holy. And what's he going to do? He is going to literally become the sin offering. He's going to become the sin offering that God, his intimate partner, I don't know how else to say that because I can't get on that level either, is going to turn his back on him. Yeah. That's the agony mm -hmm. of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Mm -hmm. He knew that there was coming that moment of separation when he was going to cry out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. I can't get my Hebrew out today. But my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out in his humanness, in that agony, but he cried out in his deity, knowing he was being separated from God because a holy God could not look on sin. And when he turned his back on sin, the whole earth shuddered, literally. You've got earthquake, you've got black, you've got dark, you've got thunder. You have heaven, in my estimation, crying because of what's just taken place. And he did that knowingly. When I realize that, when I can comprehend that on a level where I see and understand like I don't now, and I see those nail-pierced feet and hands, oh my goodness, oh, the, the, my God, how can I say thank you? How can I begin to tell you what's in my heart of appreciation? Oh my God, what do I have that I can do for you? I don't even have a chance to serve you now. That was back there on earth. I'm in heaven now. What can I do? What do I have that I can give you? You've given me everything. You've given me my life. You've given me everything. Oh, you've given me a crown. That crown was my joy because it showed me what I did for you. It was something I was proud of in the right way. Mm -hmm. But you know what, Lord? That's the most precious thing I've got right now. And here it is yours. Let me give it back to you. Let me put in your hands something tangible to say thank you. 
And well, it's not enough. I wish I had a thousand crowns, Pam, to throw at his feet. I wish I had a thousand hallelujahs, tongues to keep saying hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I want to praise him forever and ever. I want to shout it to the mountaintops. I want it to go down to earth. I want it to go over the heavens, under the heavens. I want it to be reverberating louder and louder and louder. And I'm not alone because I'm watching all you guys fill up with tears the same way I have. And if we feel that here and now, oh, my word, what's it going to be like there and then? (sighs) Again, the ineffable, indescribable love of our God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord! Let heaven hear us right now and let him rejoice with us. 24 elders, get up and dance around that throne for me. Bow down for me right now. Be at this nail-pierced feet and say glory, hallelujah, thank you, God. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. Forgive me. Yeah, I hope I have a thousand crowns, Pam, and every single one of them. Let me give it to you again and again and again, Lord, and let me see him be glorified. And what thrills me is I'm not going to be alone in that. You all are going to be doing the same thing, and maybe all of us together will feel like we've begun to thank him. And then we get to do it for a thousand years and 10,000 years and 10 billion years and 10 trillion years. And we've only just begun. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that? I can hardly wait. (laughs) So, let me get down to earth. Sorry. Come back here. I, I, I do wear my emotions sometimes. I remember a friend of mine calling her time with the Lord liquid devotions. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> so we're there. We've had the consummation. We've had our time. And we're going to come back down with him. And we're going to get into that part. And we're just, we got to get there. This is a good class, but we got to get there. Best is yet to come. But that wedding supper is going to be for a number of days. It's not just a day. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. I think I actually have one. <laughs> I got one. Thank you. That wedding supper is going to last. Uh, we don't know how long, literally how long here on earth. We'll talk about time when we get to it. But excuse me. We shouldn't have started. <laughs> um, but here's where I believe it comes at the beginning of the millennial. Let me get into this, and we'll see where it happens. Um, but, but keep in mind, um, traditionally, today, a Jewish wedding feast that follows the old traditions lasts a week. Okay? The bride and the groom are, are put on display in the beginning, but they go in and they consummate their marriage while the feast continues on. You know what? I will take a bun of your... I need one more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. This was so awesome. Just hearing about this, just coming to this point of this wedding feast, because go with me to uh, Revelation 19. And uh, as I said, we were going to do a short review. Ha! (laughs) You all know me by now. (laughs) Uh, But notice what has happened, okay? In verse 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And we know our righteousness is as filthy rags. It is the Lord's righteousness. Then he said to me, Right. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what we've been talking about now. And he said to me, Okay, this is the voice coming out of the throne from verse 5, okay? This is the one who's talking with him, and he said to me, these are true words of God. These are the true sayings. You know what he's attesting? It's the angel in heaven saying, I can swear by this. This is true. You ever heard that expression, it's too good to be true? Guess what? It's not. Not when you're talking about this. And that's what I think the angel is saying. It's true. You can bank on it, John, Yohanan. You can take it to the bank. Remember, Yohanan is on the aisle where he's been kicked out for his testimony. He's been put out there to die. 
He's not in a nice place. He doesn't have a warm bed in a nice home to go to. He's not feasting on a meal that's been prepared for him like a king. And he's being told, this is the scene. You've come through all of this horror, Yochanan. You've seen the tribulation. You're seeing it come to its fullness now where that last bowl is being poured out. That's the fullness of God's wrath. And yet, look at where you are in the heavens. Look at your feast. Look at this marriage ceremony. This is the true words of Elohim. Not my words. Not the angel's words. This is the words of God. God. Wow. What does Yohanan do? He acts just like us. He is so human. I love it. <laughs> then I fell. Yohanan, John, I fell at his feet to worship him. The one who's talking to him, he is so excited over what he's hearing. It is so wonderful. He falls down to worship this one. Oops. What's he say? <gasps> He said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Yeshua, the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Worship Him. For the testimony of Yeshua, Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. Wow. we got to unpack all that, but notice that's how I know that the voice, and we talked about who that voice was earlier, and we said we weren't sure. When I followed it through to the end of the chapter, or the, to this point in the chapter, I know for a fact now that voice was not the voice of the Lord. It came out of the throne. Well, remember around the throne, you've got all this activity. It could have been the voice of one of the elders, although since he's called an angel, I'm going to say no because the angels are separate. But the angels are there too. We know that there's angels around. There's the four living creatures. There's the 24 elders. There's the others who, who have gone on before us. So we know there's a lot, and it's all around the throne. So it's not saying that it was the voice of the one sitting on the throne. If it had said that, we'd know that was God. And if it was that, then he wouldn't have been seen in a manifestation where Yochanan would have fallen down to worship him and would have been told, hold it, wait a minute. All worship goes to the Lord God and to he only. Okay? Let's break that down. First, and by the way, it is John so and raptured. He's so caught up. He's just so, he's gone through the horrors. Now he's getting all this glory and seeing what's coming. He's seeing the fact that the one who has been so mistreated mm. is now going to be glorified. Mm. Remember how I said, if yeah. we took Revelation out of the Bible, we'd never see him glorified on earth. Ooh. Do you realize that? We had to go a long ways. We had to start all the way back to Bereshit in the beginning. We had to go all the way back to Adam, our first father. We had to come all the way through this time. And we know it's been about 6,000 years. We had to come through a lot. Could be more, but, you know, around that time approximately. I'm not setting dates, okay, to get to this point. You ever gone through a thriller? I tripped into one by accident once. I'm not a thriller watcher, okay? I like happily ever after, and I'll cheat and read the end of the book before I get to it, okay? That's the way I am. But it was, it was true story centered around the Holocaust, and that's how it caught my attention. I flipped channels, saw something Jewish, it drug me in, and it ended up being a thriller. And this person's trying to rescue another Jew, and they go through... I mean, they're, they're shot at. I don't remember what all happens, but all the way through. And I don't know how this is going to end. I didn't get to watch the end before the beginning. I was literally on the seat of my pants on the edge of my chair, go, go, you know, trying to get them through. And in the very last scene, although it almost cost the rescuer his life, too, and there's, I mean, he's carrying her because she can't even walk for herself now. But at the very last scene, they're rescued. They make it. It had a happy ending. <sighs> I was so relieved. <laughs> but, but the way I felt, you know, I mean, I just, I was drained and all my emotion came out and I'm just, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Well, see, that's Yochanan. He's just, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I've been through all this thriller called life. Ah, <sighs> thank you, God. I think that's how we're going to feel. <laughs> we made it. When my mom slipped out of my presence and into eternity, my, one of my first thoughts was, you made it, Mom. Mm. You made it. Mm -hmm. 
And I heard Paul to continue pressing on toward the high calling, to continue fighting the good fight. But even Shaul Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. He knew his days were being numbered. He knew he could go into the presence of the Lord in the victory of the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. That's where we are too. Hang on just a little bit longer. Just a little bit longer. Maybe not even through today. And we'll be there. Uh, I, I, I just I can't man I've told you all along heaven's noisy well can you imagine the split second that we realize we're there oh my goodness I think we're going to do our best to deafen those who've been there who think it's been so great <laughs> with all of our praises and hallelujahs and here's Yohanan but he's told by this angel I'm just your fellow servant don't worship me worship all the way through scripture only goes to God and to Yeshua Jesus. It never goes to his angels, not even his archangels, nobody else ever gets worshipped. We That's see right. that very That's clearly. Right. And why does he call himself a fellow servant? Yes, nothing on earth receives it. Go to Hebrews. This is the angels. This is what the angels are. And and we think angels are wow. Well, and they are. Because God created them. We're all wow. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 7 says, Indeed, when speaking of angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds and his servants fiery flames? He sends the angels out like the wind. He sends them out like fiery flames. But keep going. Drop down because I'm in a hurry. We're still stuck with the clock. (laughs) Verse 13, Moreover, to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Who did God say that to? Yeshua Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Remember I said his seat is a love seat. Built for two. (laughs) God the Father, God the Son, sitting there together. The Son on the right hand of the Father. Not the angels. There's where our worship goes. Remember, everything in heaven is focused at that throne. Remember, the 24 elders are on thrones also. But they're little thrones. They're not on the high throne. They're on the little thrones. And I don't know why they're on thrones, except God is, is God. And he says that he puts them on thrones. He blesses, he gives, but aren't they, these angels that he's never said, sit on my right hand, aren't they merely spirits who serve, who are sent out to help those whom God is delivering? You may have a little different in your your scripture, but that's basically what it's saying. Do you know those angels that you think, wow. And if you've ever had an angel encounter, it is a wow encounter. (laughs) But he's saying... They're just your servant. They're here to serve you. Do you know the angels look with curiosity at our lives to see what God will do? They look into our salvation. Wow. Look at that. Because remember a time before when a head angel fell, took a third of the angels with him, and they did not see God go after and rescue them. No, God bound some under the waters until judgment. <coughs> He's banished the others out of heaven. He's told the head of it, you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. You're going to be in torment forever. In the very presence <coughs> of God, pride, I, and God said, no, no. And he did not raise a hand to rescue them. I think the only reason why he rescued man is because man wasn't in the very presence of God in that way. Yes, God came down, walked on the earth with Adam, with Eve. And that should have been enough. But God in his love was willing to demonstrate that love to us and gave us the gift of salvation. Wow. Praise you, God. Thank you, God. So they're fellow servants, and they're fellow servants to Yohanan John, right? Because John's a great guy. I mean, look at look at what God entrusted him with, and, and look at who he is. So God gives angels to Yohanan. But, but that's all, just to those special ones, right? Those 
giants, those heroes of the faith, right? Nope, What's the verse say? What does, um, what verse are we in, 10? What does 10 say? I'm a fellow servant of yours, Yochanan, and your brethren. Who are Yochanan's brethren? Us. Us. All the way down through time, we're all his brethren. We're all his brethren. They're for us also. Have you ever asked the Lord to send a hedge of angels to protect? Yeah. Not a thing wrong with that. Everything right with that. Because we even see that in, in Kings, and I'm getting ahead of myself, it's 2 Kings, um, 2 Kings 6, chapter, chapter 6, verses 13 to 17, and we'll catch this in a moment also. We'll read it then when we get to where I wanted it. But we have the story of Elisha. And Elisha and his servant Gehazi are surrounded by all of the enemy. And Gehazi's in a panic. They are outnumbered. It's going down. This is it. And Gehazi is so upset. Ah. And Elisha says, Whoa, wait a minute. Don't panic. Don't lose it on me. Don't worry. God, open his eyes that he might see. And God opened his spiritual eyes. And he saw it horses and chariots all around surrounding bigger stronger better than the enemy and Gehazi realized in a moment he had nothing to fear that's exciting hallelujah because that's for us too okay staying with verse 10 though we have now that, that the angels are um, servants to us to the brethren specifically the brethren are those who hold the testimony of Yeshua, the testimony of Jesus, okay? He tells them, puts the direction to worship God, but then he explains the testimony of Jesus. I'm sorry, I went back to Revelation 19 and the end of verse 10, okay? Um, sorry, I threw you a left curve there. We're back in 10. So they're, they're ministering to those who are the brethren because they have the testimony of Yeshua Jesus. They have their belief in Yeshua Jesus. Okay, but it makes it also very specific. For the testimony of Yeshua, the testimony of Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. What is the central theme of prophecy? Yeshua, Jesus. It's either prophecy looking toward his coming or prophecy looking back. If you're talking about salvation, if you're talking about God's plan, we are prophetically looking forward to the return. The prophecies that tell us he will come. I believe it because I've seen him fulfill every prophecy on time exactly as he said. When Yeshua came this first time and came all the way down to earth, his first coming here, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies. And it started from being born in Bethlehem. Because as I've asked you before, who in this room chose where they were going to be born? How come no hands are going up? <laughs> you can't choose where you're born. <laughs> and we've got a pregnant Miriam in Nazareth, but that's not where he's to be born. And God sees to it in the perfect timing when she's going to deliver. She's in Beit Lechem, house of bread, because he's the bread of life, being birthed where Micha, Micah, said he would be. Prophecy number one. Number two, number three, over 300 in this first coming. Every single one right. In our English, you can dot every I and you can cross every T and you put a period at the end of every single sentence. Everything completely, nothing where you have to look at it and say, mm, well, it's a little gray here, but okay, I'll give it to you. No, it is as exacting as his birth in Bethlehem all the way through. Now, if he did that so perfectly here, what about all the prophecies about the second coming? I don't doubt it for a moment. I will tell you, write out your check on it, send it to the bank of heaven, and claim it. <laughs> because you can cash in on this, and you won't be disappointed. That's what is so beautiful about prophecy. And prophecy all centers around one main theme. And that is Yeshua Jesus. And it glorifies him. Either in what he did in the first or what he'll do in the second. It's glorifying him from beginning to end 
always the theme and the object of prophecy is Yeshua Jesus, who is the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So the theme is to give glory to God. And how do we give glory to God? By recognizing Yeshua Jesus, mm -hmm. who is very God himself. Mm -hmm. So while well, Revelation is a book of prophecy, and we know that, mm -hmm. it's in direct relation to what I've just said. Even though it's future prophecy, the central theme of the book of Revelation, I take you back to the very first chapter and the very first verse and the very first words. And what do you read? The revelation, the revealing, the unveiling of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. That's our whole book. I can put it in those four words. That's our whole book. That's the whole purpose. And it does give him the glory. We see him in his divine glory in this book, like we don't in any other. We get little glimpses here and there. We have the transfiguration. We have times when you get a little bit of who the glory of God is. We're told all the way through. The stars are declaring it, literally declaring it, teaching it, telling it. Everything is centered around that the glory of Yeshua Jesus, who is God. But here in Revelation, we would not have a record of him in that glory. We'd only have the humble coming, not the glorious coming, if we didn't have it. So are you ready? <laughs> here we go. Verse 11, I love it. I saw heaven opened. Right there, i got to stop you. Right there. Heaven is opened. Opened. Okay, let me take you back because some of you weren't even with me. We've taken so long. Go all the way back to Revelation chapter 4. Jump there with me real quick. I was just going to share that. The heaven door was opened twice in the book of Revelation. Oh, a little different. Revelation, yeah, little four, different. one and um, 19. And right 11. here. But it's a and little we're different. Right there, and we're, right we're right there, but I'm going to point so you out something greater. So when people try to tell you there's only one return of Christ, <laughs> don't listen to them. <laughs> no, don't listen. But notice the difference. In chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, and that's after the church age, after the, the revelation given to the seven churches, and we know where we're at, Yohanan looked, and before me was a door standing open in heaven. Okay? Mm -hmm. A door. Roger? Open that door, please. <laughs> okay. He's opened a door. Now, if I yelled the word fire and we all tried, <laughs> we'd have a jam right there, even with an open door. The door was open for one to come up, Yochanan John. He got to come up into heaven. He got a sneak peek. Poor Yochanan. How exciting and how wonderful. But he had to come back down to earth and he had to still live here. Oh, yes. Ooh. Okay, I looked, behold, before me was a door standing open in heaven, a voice like a trumpet, the shofar blowing. Tony, where are you? <laughs> Get your shofar going. <laughs> and I heard speaking with me the voice that says, come up here, and I'll show you what must happen after the church age. Okay, and we go from there. Yochanan lifted up, to me, is a very clear picture of the rapture, that we can see very clearly him being caught up, he heard the shofar blast, and he heard the Lord say, Come up. When we read 1 Thessalonians 4 about the coming of the Lord to gather us together in the air to meet with him, we hear the shofar blast, the voice out of heaven. I think we might hear those very words. Come up. Boom. I'm gone. <laughs> Patsy Claremont, I think it is. Give credit where it's due. He'll toot. I'll scoot. <laughs> oh, there, I heard the shuffle. Are you ready? <laughs> Dora. This be a good time to go watch that uh, um, John. Yeah. St. John in Exile? Yeah. It could be. That's the shofar blowing on a cell phone. <laughs> I asked Tony to give us the sound effects. <laughs> that, if you don't know it, that's a shofar. <laughs> I should have brought my trumpet today. Maybe next week I'll bring you one and blow you away. <laughs> but notice, notice what I pointed out, okay? The door was opened for Yochanan to come up. Now, the door is open. When we come up in rapture, believe me, we're not going to stand in line. We're not going to be at a gate. And, you know, do you have your pass? <laughs> do you have your ticket? No, it's not going to be that way. But I'm contrasting it because now here back in Revelation 19 and verse 11, 
all of heaven is opened up. Not just a door. Heaven is opened up. Why does it have to be opened up? Because it's more than just one That's coming right. down. It's Yeshua Jesus coming, but he is coming all with saints. with all his saints. And we're going to read in Matthew, he's coming with his angels. So yeah. we've got a huge entourage that's yes, coming. Do. What do. happens when a king comes? Does a king come alone? No, no. 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 he's got a whole royal entourage with him, doesn't he? Yeah. Even when the kings of the east came to find Yeshua and went to the palace looking for him, don't swallow the three, three, three. we three kings. <laughs> they do that because of three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But you know what? It was a whole lot more than three. <laughs> and they came with a whole entourage. And it took them time to come, too. That's all another story. Okay, but notice, in Roman time, in Yochanan State, and I apologize for all of you who are cold. When we get to heaven, it won't be cold. And I'm, I'm going to try to do what I can to get more heat in the room next time. But I, I see you all. I'm sorry. Okay. The Roman custom, when a general returned from a battle, he would, when he was successful, he would be the first one that would go down the main street of town, and behind him would be his army. Behind his soldiers would be all the booty that they had got from their victory, and behind it were those who were chained. They were the prisoners now, the slaves. At best, they'd be sold off as slaves. At worst, they would be executed. But that's how he came through the town. Guess what he was on? Was he walking on his own two feet? No. He rode on a white horse. Victory. What do we see here? When we see heaven open and behold a white horse victory and he who sat on it he doesn't leave it for us to wonder he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war and what do we say hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> okay now some poke fun at us and say oh yeah right a white horse sure Okay, I just gave you the truth that that was what the Roman army did on earth, and that could be literally what happens. I'm not going to tell you what has to be because we are in a book that can be symbolic. But let me show you in Scripture where it is real. Go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. They're having a hard time hearing me. Sorry, but... 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. Okay, this is Elijah, Eliyahu in our Hebrew. Suddenly, as they were walking and talking, Eliyahu with Elisha, the one who's going to follow him in service, they were walking and talking, there appeared a fiery chariot with horses of fire. It separated the two of them from each other. Eliyahu went up into heaven in a whirlwind. I take the scripture literally. I believe that literally it was a horse and chariot that came down and in a whirlwind scooped up Eliyahu into the chariot and they went into heaven. He was taken away from the presence of Elisha. Okay? It's the picture. Kind of like it. The difference is Elisha was a believer so he would have gone too. So not the best picture but... But yes, okay, but I think that was literal. I think that's how it happened. I don't think that's something that they just chose to tell in that way. I think it's how it happened. Go to 2 Kings chapter 6. That's the story I just referred to shortly ago, but let me read a couple of the verses um, just so I back up with Scripture what I say. 13, he said, go, uh, chapter 6 of 2 Kings verse 13, he said, go and see where he is so that I can send and bring him here. They told him he's in, in Dothan. Why did I want to read Dothan. that verse? Okay. Uh, or Dothan is probably how you have it. Um, let, me, let me start in 15, really. That's the background, okay, um, to what's going on with Elisha, because they're after him, okay? Verse 15, the servant of the man of God got up early in the morning. On going outside, he saw an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city. This is Gehazi. This is his servant. His servant said, oh, my master, this is terrible. What are we going to do? And he answered, don't be afraid. I hear the angels. Fear not. But this time it was Elisha here on earth. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us outnumber 
those who are with them. Elisha then prayed, Adonai, I ask you to open his eyes so that he can see. Then Adonai opened the young man's eyes and he saw. There before him, all around Elisha, the mountain was covered with horses and fiery chariots. God's got his army that way too. And if he wants to literally come on a white horse, or Yeshua Jesus, on a white horse, then he can come literally on a white horse. This will not be a horse like uh, an earthly horse that could trip and could be hurt and, and you know get shot or whatever. No, this would be a horse in, in victory, a heavenly horse. But this is a picture of victory. And that's what we want to see. He is coming back in that victory. Remember the first time he came, Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter, uh, I think it's 9. It's either 9 or 10. Do I have it in my notes? Hmm, it'll come up somewhere. What it says is that he came lowly riding on a donkey. I'm sure I've got it somewhere in my notes. Nine, I'm not nine. finding it. Nine, nine? Thank you. Zechariah. Why can't I remember? Nine, nine. What book is that? <laughs> Zechariah. 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 Tells about his humble, lowly, riding on a donkey, a beast of burden, not the mighty, majestic horse that Zechariah we're seeing here. 14, but nine. first coming was to come suffering servant. Second coming is to come glorious and worthy of reigning. R E I G N, um, not not rain like water out of heaven. Okay, so the setting shows us he's coming regally, he's coming majestically, he's coming mighty, and he is called faithful and true. What have we just come through? We've just come through the lying Antichrist who has been anything but faithful and true. Anything but. He has spun a lie. He has swallowed as many as he could. He deceived as many as he could. Remember it said the deception would be so great as if even the believers could have been deceived. They can't be, but it was so close. It was. It would be so hard. I think of the, the spider and the fly. You know, the spider puts out his web and then he invites the fly, come into my parlor, <laughs> said the spider to the fly. You know, this is the lying Antichrist who, who is being stopped by the one who is faithful and true. How is Yeshua faithful? Oh, I'm sorry. How is Yeshua faithful? He is faithful to God. He is faithful to God's will. He said, I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of the one who sent me. He, in his faithfulness, has kept the will of his Father. He is faithful to us because he's promised us deliverance. He is faithful to those saints who are living during the tribulation days where he says, if I didn't come back and stop it, there wouldn't be any flesh left alive. But he comes back and he stops it. He is faithful to his word. He is faithful to the word of our Elohim Father. He is faithful on, on both fronts. He, he, the fidelity of this. He's trustworthy. He is faithful. It's manifested toward those who trust him. It's righteousness. Our book has been full of war. It's been full of conflict. It's been full of lie and deceit. It's been written in blood. We see blood up to the horse's bridle. Look at the contrast with this one on a white horse. White speaking of the purity. Faithfulness to keep his word. Faithful in the first coming, faithful in the second coming. This is a mighty and an awesome contrast to all that Yochanan has just seen. And even though we've drug it out, if we could have seen it along, the contrast would really stand out, really stand out. Now think about the ones living during that time who have come through seven years of horror. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then to see this scene, oh my goodness. I mean, wow. So he is faithful. He is true. True. No faults in him. Not one word a lie. Remember what started all this was a lie. Mm -hmm. He tells the Pharisees when they're lying that they're their father, the devil, the father of all lies. Mm -hmm. Lying is huge. Seven things God hates, top of the list, lying. Why? I think because that's what started this all. And when we use the expression that that lie is out of the pit of hell, we are so right because that's where all lying comes from and where it's all going to go and where it's going to end up. He is faithful and he is true. 
You don't need to worry about his keeping his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. Is God. Go down to verse 14 of Yochanan 1 that I just quoted. And you have that that word tabernacled with us. Dwelt among us. And he goes on and tells in that coming and dwelling was for our salvation. Faithful. All the way through. And it even says, in righteousness. Our next phrase, in righteousness. That is a controlling factor of judgment. You want right judgment. You want it to be right on. You want it to be true. You want it to be fair. We get upset when we don't see justice done. Go with me to Isaiah. Yeshaya, Isaiah 11. Isaiah chapter 11. The righteousness of our Lord and Savior. On that day, Isaiah, oops, I'm reading 11, 11. Um, but I just tell you, Isaiah 11, 3. Chapter 11 and verse 3. He will be inspired by fearing Adonai, by fearing the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but he will judge the impoverished justly. This is the Lord. He's going to judge justly. He will decide fairly for the humble of the land. He will strike the land with a rod from his mouth and slay the wicked with a breath from his lips. That's ruling with a rod of iron. We're going to come to that part very shortly. Justice will be the belt around his face, waist, faithfulness the sash around his hips. He is faithful, he is just, he is righteous, he is true, and it is in that that the judgment goes out. All fair. What deserves punishment will get punishment. What deserves reward will receive reward. He is faithful. He is just. He is true. What does Satan do to his people? He lies to them. He tells their population today, if you want, and he's speaking to the men in particular, because the women aren't, don't even count, but to the men in particular, if you want to be guaranteed heaven, and what's heaven? Heaven is where you'll have 72 versions of, on 72 mattresses of 72 different colors. How that could be heaven is beyond me. But all you have to do is go out and kill. Take as many Israelis with you as you can, and your reward will be in heaven. And they do that. They go out. They strap that belt around themselves, and they blow themselves up. And where do they awaken? In hell. <laughs> yeah, in Can hell. you imagine when they realize they've bought the lie they and sure nothing is. can wow. change it? Because when you leave this earth, it is all settled. It is all done. No second chances for anyone. What a contrast. He judges righteously. He judges fairly. Messiah is the judge also. Look at Yochanan, John. Chapter 5. Remember, he's our same author. This is his earlier book that, that tells about the life of Yeshua. Chapter 5 and verse 22, we see it's the Messiah who will be judging because we read there, the Father, God the Father, does not judge anyone but has entrusted all judgment to the Son so that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. Whoever fails to honor the Son is not honoring the Father who sent him. Yes, indeed, I tell you that whoever hears what I'm saying and trusts the one who sent me has eternal life. That is, he will not come up for judgment, but has already crossed over from death to life. Yes, indeed, I tell you that there is a time coming, in fact, it's already here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will come to life. Those who do not listen will stand at that great white throne judgment and receive just, fair, and right judgment for their lives. God will deal fairly and justly, but he's put it in the hands of the Son. Let's keep reading why. Go with me to Acts chapter 10. Next book, chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, go down all the way down to verse 42. And we read, Then he commanded us, the, the, the Talmudim, the disciples, to proclaim and attest to the Jewish people that this man has been appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. And when they're saying this man, they're referring to Yeshua in his earthly form. They're seeing him son of man as well as son of God. And they're saying that God has given it to him to judge all men. Um, verse, I read verse 42, to judge the living and the dead. 
those who are alive when he returns, those that already died, they will stand before the Lord one day in that time of judgment. Go to chapter 17, Acts also, chapter 17 and verse 31. Acts 17, 31. For he has set a day when he will judge the inhabited world and to do it justly by means of a man whom he has designated. And he has given public proof of it by resurrecting this man from the dead. So God has put it into the hands of a man. What man? The man that God resurrected from the dead. So we know it's Yeshua Jesus. Why does he put it into the hands of the man? Because is it fair for angels to judge man? They don't know what it's like. You could say, not us, but you know, the unsaved could say to an angel, but you don't get it. You don't understand. You don't have earthly form. You couldn't decay. You couldn't suffer. You couldn't feel the pain that I felt. But could they say that to the man of God? No. No. There's nothing they can say that he could not say to them, I was, I felt, I know sorrow, I know death, I know how hard, I know frailty, I got tired. We read that he went down the boat, went to sleep because he was tired. We read that he had to depart from the people because he was tired. I'm glad he understands my frailty. And because he does, and because he lived perfectly and rightfully, he has the right to judge. And he will judge fairly and right. Go to the next book, Romans. Acts, Romans. Now we're into what Shoal Paul says. Remember out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Romans 2 and verse 16. Romans 2, 16. On a day when God passes judgment on people's inmost secrets, according to the good news as I proclaim it, he does this through the Messiah, Yeshua. Shaol Paul says there's going to be a day when God judges the heart. He sees all the way through to those secrets. You can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool most of the people a lot of the time, but you can never fool God any of the time. <laughs> He knows the heart. And when he looks at that heart, he calls it what it is. Wicked, out. Saved, in. Hallelujah. We're in. Okay, so he's going to judge in righteousness. I'm back in, in Revelation 19.10. He judges, he's faithful and true. Judges in righteousness and he wages war. You know what? He's right to wage war. This is the Lamb that's now the lion. He is going to come as a lion roaring. His first coming, he came as the lamb. He came as a lamb that would be slain. He came as the one who would give his life, that he'd prepare the way for us. But now he is coming back as the king of the jungle. It's a jungle down here, people. And he's king, and he's coming, and he's going to roar. And the whole world is going to listen. And he's going to roar justly and fairly and rightly and truthfully. He is coming for justice. Go back with me to Revelation chapter 5. We haven't been there for a long, long time. It was a wonderful chapter when we were there. I love visiting it again. We see the Lamb, and we see God in this very clearly because the Lamb takes the scroll from the hand of God. In Revelation 5, verse 5, it says, One of the elders said to me, because no one could open that scroll, remember? And Yohanan cried. No one could open the scroll. They looked in heaven. They looked on earth. They looked under the earth. That means they looked at, at the occupants of heaven. Obviously, they did not look at Yeshua because the Lamb's going to be able to do it. But they looked at the elders. They looked at the angels. They looked at, at the, the, the whoever was right there. Then they looked on earth, Yochanan and all of his people. Then they looked under the earth, in essence, the heart of the earth, Sha'ol, where the dead are. And they're saying, you know what? There is nobody from time beginning all the way to today. There is nobody who is found worthy. Not in that earth. Not someone who, who was alive on earth and isn't now. Not someone on the earth now. We can't even find anybody in heaven. And John, Yonah, oh, no one can be found. But the angel says, wait, 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 wait. don't cry, Yonah. Don't cry. Why should he not cry? Because look. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh, is it behold there? Cool. That's better than my life. Behold! 
<laughs> Remember when God says, Behold, he wants attention. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has won the right to open the scroll and its seven seals. That means he owns the scroll. And what's the scroll of? It's the grant deed to this earth. He bought back the earth with his shed blood. He paid the price to redeem us. We are his because he could open that scroll. Hallelujah! <laughs> if he did not, we'd go down in defeat. Why was Yohanan ready to cry? No one to save him. That's what it was. If the scroll couldn't be opened, if there hadn't been an owner of it, then Satan is the owner. And yes, if he is the one who owns it, ball your head off. God forbid. Hallelujah. It is forbidden. Because the Lamb of God was slain, but rose from the dead, and he is Lion, Root of David, Tribe of Judah, every single prophecy promised, he is in that line. And being man, he reclaimed what man gave up, what man lost. First Adam lost it, second Adam gained it back. And he gave it to us all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <sighs> yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You ever been rescued by somebody? Even yeah. something not so important as the eternal life? And you're still so thankful. Yes, yes so yes. grateful. Yes, yes. You know, I I failed to bring out also in his faithfulness. Go with me because he's faithful and true. I've, I, I want to bring this out in um, our new covenant and our original covenant. Go first to Philippians. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Get our whole complete thought here. Chapter 2. Verse 5, show Paul writing to those in Philippi, he says, you need to have a certain kind of attitude. Let me tell you about that attitude. Let your attitude toward one another be governed by your being in union with Messiah Yeshua. Okay, you belong to the Messiah. You're his. Now, that should dictate how you act toward everyone else. You should act different now. You ever have a parent when you were a child say, you're my kid, you need to act like it? <laughs> I don't know how you all were, but I grew up being a PK. A PK or an MK, missionary's kid, pastor's kid. Guess what? You all out there that aren't have rules for us who are. Oh, they're perfect. They have little halos, and they act just absolutely perfect. Don't do that to a pastor's kid. <laughs> because you know what? That pastor's kid is just as human as the non-pastor's kid. But, but... I did know when I went with my parents to a church meeting, there was certain behavior expected of me. And if I didn't measure up to that certain behavior, I was sure to wish I had later. <laughs> Yeshua is saying, you're mine, you're reflecting me, you should have this kind of attitude. Because even though he, verse 6, was in the form of God, he didn't regard it equality with God, something to be possessed by force. I'm demanding. He didn't come down to earth and say, hey, I'm God, and if you don't like it, well, you know what, I can, and your life is gone. <laughs> we don't see him make Krispy Kreme out of, <laughs> or critters, out of the people around him, even the ones who rejected him, even the ones who nailed him to the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He didn't say, you know what? I'm going to give you what you deserve. That shows me right there he was God because I cannot imagine not wanting to just, you know, I've had enough. I've, I've suffered enough. You've, you've disrespected me enough. Oh, yeah? <clears throat> let, me, let me put you in your place. But he didn't. On the contrary, even though he was equal to God, he emptied himself, verse 7, he took on the form of a slave. He didn't even come down as a prince, let alone king. He took on the form of a slave by becoming human like us. And when he appeared as a human, he humbled himself still even more. He, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Sorry, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And I, I'm reading a complete Jewish. That may be why it's confusing you some. Sorry. But I'm reading um, verse 8. That he humbled himself even more. He became a servant. He became a slave. He bent down to earth to be a servant for us. And then even more, he became obedient to death. Remember how he said he came for one purpose? He came to die. He didn't come for some glorious life. He came knowing 
I've come for one purpose, and his whole life was spent toward that purpose, coming to that focal point of the death on the cross. And hallelujah, he did not stay dead. God raised him from the dead that he didn't just pay the penalty, but he conquered it once and for all. So death is under his feet. Amen. You can see his foot raise his hand Amen. in victory. Hallelujah. Death is done away yes. in the Lord. Amen. And we know it to be true because even when I told you all that my Aunt Georgia went home to be with the Lord, yes, her outer body, that shell, died. But her soul lives forever, and she is more alive than ever before in the presence of her Savior. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you can all apply it to whoever you have oh, lost that sting. knows the Lord. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? It is not there. And I have stood at the grave a very, very dear ones that I could not love anymore, couldn't be closer to my heart. And I know that in that same moment of earthly grief was heavenly joy. Amen. Amen. Only those who've gone through it who know the Lord can understand that. That is true for every one of us. And I know Kathy's been a testimony with the home going of her husband. Many of you others have lost mates, friends, loved ones also. We all, same song, another verse yeah. because he's faithful to all that he humbled himself this is the kind of life that he lived that in honor of the name given Yeshua in that name Yeshua Jesus every knee will bow in heaven on earth and under the earth remember all heaven we see them bowing here on earth there's some of us bowing under the earth where it's been done and it's over with and they are in their their state of waiting for that judgment they have to bow they have to know. You know what? I put myself here. He died for me. I rejected. I have to bow. Tip the hat, however you want to say it. In heaven, on earth, and earth, every tongue will confess, will acknowledge that Yeshua, the Messiah, is Adonai, is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Remember, the glory of God the Father is Yeshua the Son. They are both glorified. I cannot understand, I cannot explain the separation because there isn't a separation, yet there is a separation. When we get to heaven and we have a mind like Messiah, then we will be able to say, oh, I get it now. Yeah. But you know what? If we could understand God down here, that only make him as good as down here. Right. Yeah. Thank God he's bigger, he's better, he's greater. Hallelujah. And he's done it all for us. Now, that's... Philippians, that's to the first generation of believers after Yeshua is raised from the dead. Let me take you back to the original covenant. Go with me to Yeshua, Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, and if I'm talking fast, I saw that clock. <laughs> Isaiah, where'd you go? There you are, Isaiah 45. The hurrier I go, the behinder I get. How many of you understand that? <laughs> Isaiah 45, and go down to verse 23. Okay, and we're going to read right now 23. That's the verse in particular I want. In the name of myself, I have sworn. From my mouth has rightly gone out a word that will not return. Okay? God's spoken. Isaiah 45, verse 23. God has spoken. Okay? He says, in the name of myself, I've sworn. Remember when God raises his right hand and swears by himself because there's no one else that he can swear by? There's no one greater. There's no one equal. So he had to swear by himself. Well, in essence, that's what he's saying here again. I've raised my hand in an oath. I've sworn. I have spoken and I have said in the name of myself from my mouth it's rightly gone out a word that will not return. It means it's not going to come back void. This is a word that goes out and reverberates to the end of the earth, to the end of times and even beyond that, out into eternity. That to me... To me, to God, to God, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. What are they going to confess about me? That only in Adonai, the Lord, is justice and strength as it goes on in Isaiah. But what he is saying, the same thing said about the Lord is said about God. My point of this again is the deity, they are equal at the name of Yeshua, Every knee will bow. God says, I'll make it happen, but he is me. He's in me, I'm in him. Remember, Yochanan, uh, John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. And the Jewish people, 
got it. They picked up stones. They wanted to stone him. Why? Oh, you're blaspheming. You're equating yourself with God. That's worthy of us stoning you to death. They didn't miss it. They didn't say, oh, he said he was a good person. He was a good rabbi. He's a good teacher. No, they got it. He claimed to be God. He is God. Isaiah says it. Sha'ol Paul says it. Yochanan John says it. And we today are declaring it. God and Yeshua are one, the glory of God, hallelujah, at every, at the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow. You ever seen an enemy of the Lord? I can't wait till I see those enemies bow and serve him the honor due his holy name. And it's going to start with Satan and it's going to have a whole entourage afterwards of all those who have followed him in that life. Amen. amen and amen hallelujah because he is faithful and true and righteous and judges fairly wages war mm, I'm out of time <laughs> ah. you know what do I race through the next few to get that whole complete thought in here no alright I'll tell you what you have to go through that part of verse 11 with me next time because it is too great to race yeah, through. Race. But, but let me just sum it up, okay? okay. Let me tantalize you make you want to come back. <laughs> okay. okay, we've got it. Faithful, righteous, true, judging, waging that war. All of these that we've said, we're going to see that divine judgment. We're going to see the fire of judgment. His eyes are like fire. We'll go into where we've heard that before. We're going to see that this one who is judging is king. He is crowned with a crown. Now, we have different crowns. I'm going to tell you the difference between his crown and our crowns. Because we've thrown all our crowns at his feet, but the crown he's wearing here is a different crown. You have to come back next week to find out what that crown is. And, and... We've got more names to go because we're going to get all kinds of names. Remember my favorite word? The ineffable name of our God. We're going to go into, in, in, into how wonderful, hint, wonderful his name is. We're going to hit the ineffable, indescribable. She caught it. That's one name. We're going to, we're going to go to one that's above it all. Hallelujah. You want to know what that name is? Yes. Yes. Come next week. Come next week. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I thought we'd get there today, but it's coming. Uh, if it's a cliffhanger, yes. if you're a good student, you know how to cheat. Yes, we do. You just go read. <laughs> because I'm not going to take your Bibles from you. I'm going to tell you, open up, cheat, come back with that name on your lips too. So when I ask, we're all ready. Yeah. You want to come back and praise our God yeah. who is indescribable, who is awesome, who is amazing, who is righteous, faithful, true, Yeshua. Don't you love him? Yeah. <laughs> I love him more than when class began. How does that happen? I, I always think I'm at capacity. I can't love you anymore, Lord. And, and, then, and then he just pulls it open. And I love him more. And I see in faces, you love him too. Praise our God. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord God. Our faithful, our true, our loving God. Praise be to your holy name forever and ever and ever. And Lord God, I can't wait till bodily we are home in heaven too. But take the praises of this classroom, the hallelujahs, the amens, the, the, the joy that is here. Lord God, hear it. Let it ring in your ears. Let it bring a smile to your face. Let it be joy overflowing as we join the heavenly chorus and sing forever and ever. Hallelujah. Praise to our holy God. We bow at the name of Yeshua, Jesus. And in that precious name, amen and amen. So be it. Hallelujah. We agree. Hallelujah. You want to go for another hour? <laughs> yeah, I'm just getting started. Exactly. It's like, it can't be over. i got to explode. <laughs> you got to let me go. If we let you say, teach that it all about...
That's why they don't believe in the beef and sea beef. They think they'll be bowing with the loss. But I guess we're bowing in heaven. We're bowing, yes, heaven, and not with the loss. Not with the, not loss, with the loss. loss. So therefore they believe they will bow. They think that means the righteous and the loss will be bowing. The loss will, but not at the same time in the same way. When they stand before God at the great white throne judgment, they have to bow. They have to know the righteous God has judged. Right. Yeah, that's when they will bow. We're bowing up in heaven. That's We're right. bowing now. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, no, it's different. They get confused with that. 